Well, God bless the great state of South Carolina. <laughs> well, and, and I love you back. It, it, it is a blessing to be with so many friends. Let, let, let me say to, to Scott Cooper, thank you for your hard work organizing this group. Frank Gaffney, the one and only, you are a clarion voice for truth. And there are a lot of good friends who have come here today, including Alan Clements, Lieutenant Colonel Bill Connor, Javen Browder, Joe Dugan, and so many more. It is great to be with you. We're here tonight talking about the threats to America and across the world. We have to start by cl being clear about who and what it is we're dealing with. There are many challenges to America across the globe. Putin's Russia, an authoritarian China, and hostile regimes in the Western Hemisphere from Venezuela to Cuba. But even with all of these wolves around the sled, as General Mike Flynn would say, radical Islamic terrorism is the greatest threat to the United States today. And that is, of course, what we are gathered here to discuss candidly, openly, truthfully. The threat has many faces. On the Sunni side, we have ISIS, which is so vicious that some are now suggesting that Al-Qaeda might, by comparison, be a more moderate partner for America. How through the looking glass have we gone? But the trunk of the poisonous tree is and remains the Islamic Republic of Iran. It is Shiite rather than Sunni, but shares the very same antipathy towards freedom, modernity, and the West. And it is an antipathy so violent that they are compelled to try to destroy America and her allies. For 35 years, the leaders of Iran have made their intentions clear through countless acts of terror, kidnappings, bombings, attacks on our soldiers. Even in 2011, an attempted attack on the ambassador to the United States from Saudi Arabia, which was sadly hatched in my home state of Texas. A few weeks ago, a courageous prosecutor from Argentina, Alberto Nisman, died under highly suspicious circumstances just hours before he was supposed to present new evidence of Iranian complicity in the 1992 bombing of a Jewish community center in Buenos Aires. Iran, uh, Iran actively supplies, trains, and funds the designated terrorist organizations Hamas and Hezbollah, which are dedicated to the destruction of our dear friend and ally, the nation of Israel. This relentless campaign has earned Iran the distinction of being the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. These are not events from the distant past. They are happening today, right now, there is no reason to think that Iran has any intention of modifying its behavior and plenty of reason to believe that their intent is to continue and to expand their terrorist activity. There is also great reason to believe that the Islamic Republic of Iran has been pursuing nuclear weapons capability for 20 years, first with the help 
of AQ Khan, and then with Russia's assistance. A decade ago, we discovered the uranium enrichment plant at Natanz and the heavy water plant at Iraq. Just last month, the IAEA released a report documenting Iran's ongoing refusal to answer the agency's questions about its nuclear program, leading a European official to wonder, according to the New York Times, if it, quote, makes sense to lift the sanctions before Iran satisfies the inspectors. This was an EU official quoted in the New York Times. One could only hope and pray that the Obama administration would demonstrate half of the skepticism. And yet the Obama administration's approach to Iran has been a profound failure. The reality about Iran makes it all, more, all the more confounding that the Obama administration has displayed no skepticism. Instead, a sunny optimism that they could overcome decades of relentless hostility through diplomatic outreach. As a candidate, Obama promised negotiations with no preconditions, one of the few promises on which he's delivered. During the transition, the idea of a special envoy to Iran was floated. In the first few months in office, President Obama traveled to Cairo to proffer his outstretched, outstretched hand if, as he proposed in his first inaugural, Iran would only unclench its fist. The mullah's rejection of the charm offensive was made abundantly clear just days after Mr. Obama proclaimed a new beginning in June of 2009 when the Iranian people poured into the streets to protest the highly suspicious re-election of Iranian President Ahmadinejad. The Iranian authorities launched a brutal clampdown, protesters demanding freedom and crying out for America were shot in the street. The administration said nothing, and instead let the mullahs do as they please. Hillary Clinton has subsequently written that she came to regret, those are her words, standing by silently as the protest was crushed. But neither she nor anyone in the administration has demonstrated any understanding of the opportunity we had then to finally see regime change from a radical regime dedicated to the destruction of Israel and America. Instead, the administration doubled down on their bet that Supreme Leader Khamenei would prove a reliable partner for peace and that Iran could be dissuaded through negotiations to stop their decade-long pursuit of nuclear weapons capability. Sixteen months ago, the administration launched direct talks with Iran under the extremely lax terms of the so-called Joint Plan of Action, terms by which Iran is compelled to dismantle not a single centrifuge or to relinquish even a single pound of enriched uranium. In exchange, Iran has received significant economic relief. During the many meetings in Geneva, Vienna, Paris, Lausanne, over the course of not one but two extensions, the JPA has failed to produce even a single meaningful concession from Iran. The American position, meanwhile, has dwindled to the point that the JPA appears to be the high water mark and the best we can hope for now is a phase out of its terms. This is the very portrait of what Prime Minister Netanyahu
predicted would be a, quote, very, very bad deal, an historic mistake when the JPA was first signed. Indeed, when Prime Minister Netanyahu came to Washington just two weeks ago to plead with President Obama one final time to stop this madness, the response from the White House was to refuse to meet with Israel's Prime Minister and to launch a relentless campaign of ridicule and attack manifesting right now in President Obama's national field director helping run the campaign to defeat Pre Prime Minister Netanyahu in Israel in coordination with a nonprofit group that has received hundreds of thousands of taxpayer dollars from the American taxpayer. What does it say about the President of the United States when he's more concerned about undermining and attacking the Prime Minister of Israel than he is standing up to the mortal threat a nuclear Iran poses? As I sat on the floor of Congress listening to Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech, I could only think we were hearing echoes of history, that this is Munich in 1938 all over again. And I will say the adjective that has been most frequently applied to Netanyahu's speech was Churchillian. Because he speaks with a simple gravity and clarity that it is my hope and prayer both the members of Congress and the American people listen to the words of our friend Prime Minister Netanyahu. Galvanized by the heroic speech, 46 senators joined Senator Tom Cotton in sending a letter to the nation of Iran. The 47 senators together informed the nation of Iran of how our constitutional system works in this country. that the President of the United States lacks the authority to unilaterally make law. And that any agreement President Obama reaches with Supreme Leader Khamenei will not be binding on the United States unless and until it is ratified by the Senate as a treaty or passed into law by the United States Congress. response from the White House, the response from Democrats, the response from the mainstream media, although I repeat myself, <laughs> has been a hysteria that recalls the bard, methinks she doth protest too much. You know, it used to be that we didn't have to worry about presidents disregarding the Constitution. That was considered a basic job requirement. And yet this is a president who has over and over again indicated his willingness to circumvent Congress, to circumvent federal law, to circumvent the Constitution. And to understand the gravity of what the Iranians believe. Let me quote Iranian Foreign Minister Zarif, 
who said in response to our letter, the authors may not fully understand that in international law, governments represent the entirety of their respective states, are responsible for the conduct of foreign affairs, are required to fulfill the obligations they undertake with other states, and may not invoke their internal law as justification for failure to perform their international obligations. Now let me give a response to Foreign Minister Zarif. Sir, you are flat out wrong. In the United States of America, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And no president has the authority to unilaterally change American law or bind subsequent presidents or subsequent Congresses. President Obama may indeed have a pen and a phone, but the next president is going to have an eraser. So in response to this, the Obama administration has hatched their new plans as the rumors swirl Washington. They're going to go instead to the United Nations because so much good has historically come of that. <laughs> and apparently the administration and Iran together think if they just go to the UN Security Council, then they can circumvent the Constitution and Congress and the American people. They are mistaken. And I would like to note this is a topic on which I have some experience. Before I was in the United States Senate, I served as the Solicitor General of the State of Texas. And I had the privilege of litigating before the U.S. Supreme Court a number of cases, including one called Medellin versus Texas. Medellin began with a horrific crime in my hometown of Houston where two teenage girls were tragically gang-raped and murdered. The case took a very, very strange turn because the World Court, the judicial arm of the United Nations, issued an order to the United States to reopen the convictions of 51 murderers across this country. It was the first time in the history of our country a foreign court has tried to bind the U.S. justice system. Texas stood up and we fought the world court. We went to the United States Supreme Court and on the other side was the United Nations, the world court, and over 90 foreign nations. Every one of them made the exact same argument Foreign Minister Zarif made that international agreements, international law is binding, and your domestic law does not matter. Texas stood up against them, and the Supreme Court concluded 6-3 that neither the United Nations nor the World Court can bind the United States of America. South Carolina. <laughs> Both states that have a long history of producing patriots. But you know, the Medellin case didn't end there because you might say, well, gosh, today it's not just the world court, it's not just the United Nations. Today, now it's the President of the United States. I'm sorry to tell you, in Medellin, the President of the United States signed an order that attempted to order the state courts 
to obey the world court. And I'm very sad to tell you that president was not Barack Obama. It was George W. Bush. Now, I'll tell you, when that happened, I sat down with my boss, the Attorney General, talking about what to do. And George W. Bush, I believe, is a good and decent man. And he was a Texan. He was our state's former governor. He was a Republican. And yet, in this matter, he received some very, very poor advice. And I'm proud to tell you, on behalf of the state of Texas, I went before the United States Supreme Court and said, no president of the United States, including a Republican, has the authority to give up U.S. sovereignty. So President Obama may try to go to the United Nations, but it's not going to change the law in the United States of America. So what are the consequences of all of this? Well, unfortunately, one of the gravest consequences may well be that President Obama succeeds in getting the United Nations, getting for our, our allies to dismantle sanctions against Iran. That seems to be what the administration is doing. It is doing it because by all appearances it is pursuing a political agenda. The beginning of President Obama's second term, his deputy national security advisor, Ben Rhodes, said that an Iranian nuclear deal would be the Obamacare of the second term. I think he meant that as a compliment. <laughs> if this president succeeds in dismantling international sanctions, what that will do is strengthen Iran and weaken America. What that will do is accelerate Iran towards acquiring nuclear weapons. And what that will also do is substantially increase the risks of military conflict. If President Obama dismantles the international sanctions regime, the next president will come in with a far weakened hand, with many fewer tools, without the world alliance against Iran. That means if the next president discovers an Iran on the verge of acquiring nuclear weapons capability, the only tool available to the next president may well be a military attack. It's one of the things that has been missing from day one of the obama clinton Kerry foreign policy, is an understanding that weakness is provocative. Appeasement doesn't work. In America, we've always believed in peace through strength. I've introduced legislation in the United States Senate that would immediately impose and reimpose full sanctions on the nation of Iran. That would ratchet them up to make them even more debilitating and then lays out a clear path for how Iran can lift the sanctions. To lift the sanctions, Iran must disassemble every one of the 19,000 centrifuges it has built. It must hand over every pound of enriched uranium. It must disassemble its ICBM program. which exists for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to carry a nuclear weapon to the United States of America. That is how we should be approaching Iran, with far more stick and a lot less carrot.
Beyond that, we are stepping into the season where this country begins the process of selecting the next President of the United States. South Carolina is going to play a critical role in that selection. South Carolina historically has played a critical role in the selection in the Republican Party of ensuring that we nominate a strong conservative who will stand up and defend America. And a question I will suggest that should be posed to every candidate for president, whether Republican or Democrat, is if President Obama enters into an agreement with Iran that undermines our national security and increases the likelihood of Iran acquiring a nuclear weapon, will you as president abrogate that agreement on day one? Any president who is not willing to put the United States Constitution and the national security interest of our country above an ill-advised and foolish agreement with so-called Supreme Leader Khamenei is not fit to serve as Commander-in-Chief of the United States of America. Why did the Democratic establishment squeal so loudly? at the letter of 47 senators because it indicated people understand we've got 21 months of damage this administration can continue to do to this country and to the world. But come January of 2017, there will be a new resident at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And I want to simply give you some words of encouragement. It's dire. The threats are grave. And yet America has weathered grave threats before. When this great nation declared independence in 1776, the notion that a ragtag bunch of colonists might defeat the mightiest army on the face of the planet was absurd. And yet, with God's providential blessings, that's exactly what we did. When the Civil War ripped this great nation apart, pitting brother against brother as gallons of American blood spilled on this soil, for most nations, that battle, that horrible conflagration, would have destroyed them. And yet America came together and restored the Union as one nation under God. In World War II, when we faced the unspeakable evil of the Nazis, again America rose to leadership. And with God's providential blessing, defeated the face of evil. In 1979, we similarly had a president in the White House whose feckless foreign policy had made the world far, far more dangerous. We similarly were dealing with a bellicose Russia and an Iran declaring war on America and indeed seizing Americans as hostage. And yet, I want to point to you the words of Ronald Reagan sometime later. As Reagan recalled, I called a meeting of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, our military leaders, and I said to them, every offensive weapon ever invented by man has resulted in the creation of a defense against it. Isn't it possible that in this age of technology, 
that we could invent a defensive weapon that could intercept nuclear weapons and destroy them as they emerge from their silos. So SDI was born. And very shortly, some in Congress and the press named it Star Wars. If I had to choose the most important reason on the United States' side for the historic breakthroughs that were to occur during the next five years in the quest for peace and a better relationship with the Soviet Union, I would say the Strategic Defense Initiative along with the overall modernization of our military force and the revival of U.S. economic power would be front and center. We have rebuilt our military before. We have stood up to evil before. We have developed technology and missile defense and implemented it alongside our allies such as the nation of Israel once before. We have revived our economy so the engine of American free enterprise bankrupted the enemies of freedom. We've done it all before, and we can do it again. Thank you very, very much. And now I'm happy to answer or dodge any questions you like. Stand by. Thank you. Is it working? Uh, yay, it's working. Again, I'm Virginia Ellisor. I'm a lifelong South Carolinian. I'm a retired school teacher and a lifelong political activist. Thank you for being here today. It's an honor. You're one of my heroes in our Congress. But I do have a very specific question for you in a moment. But I want to tell you about one more case that Obama and Hillary Clinton took to the UN World Court. They took Governor Jan Brewer of Arizona, the governor of Arizona, and her anti-illegal immigration law, SB 1070, to the UN World Court for civil rights violations. How do you violate the civil rights? Somebody's not a citizen for this country. Anyway, it was an outrage. Uh, that was another case. You can check me out. I've, all my facts are right. I helped get the illegal immigration law passed in South Carolina by, you know, speaking to the Senate subcommittee, and we got it passed, and then Obama sued all the states that got their laws passed. In any case, here is my very specific question for you, Senator Cruz. And again, you're one of my heroes. You're doing much. I remember when you and Rand Paul filibustered, when was it, some months ago? God bless you on that. But what happened more recently, why did we fully fund Homeland Security until September of this year? I, yeah, we didn't fight the battle there. The American people put y'all back in the House and back in the Senate, but we needed some support from the Congress of the United States. We know what's in the White House. We know what he's doing to our nation. But apparently the Congress knows too, and I wonder if they care because uh, it should have been filibustered or not defunded, what, whatever, what happened, why were they fully funded through September? I think, you know, the issue I fought the longest and the hardest to try to save my nation is illegal immigration, and I am so depressed now I can't stand it because even my heroes let me down. What happened, Senator Cruz, uh, what can we do now that uh, Homeland Security has been fully, fully funded? That was our opportunity to shut it, to shut down the illegal immigration, to seal our borders, and to protect him America. The let him answer okay. the question, please. Thank you very much. 
What, what happened, Senator Cruz? We got and the question. What, where do we go from here? We what, got the question. How can the damage be undone Let now? him answer the question, please. Thank you. V Virginia, thank, thank you very much. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for your activism. Thank you for your leadership. I, I agree with you. What happened was an abomination. And unfortunately, we have seen with leadership in both houses zero desire to stand up to President Obama's illegal and unconstitutional amnesty. The reason why, unfortunately, his leadership is willing to allow it to go into effect. Now listen, there has been nobody who has fought harder or more vigorously to stop amnesty than I have. It's true. Unfortunately, this capitulation was baked in the cake back in December. If you'll recall in December, leadership in both houses pushed what they called the Cromnibus Bill. The Cromnibus funded virtually the entirety of the federal government, except for DHS. And leadership promised us back in December, we promise next spring we're going to fight on amnesty. Now, you may recall at the time, I fought tooth and nail to stop the Cromnibus. It resulted in a whole lot of my colleagues being furious and excoriating me at, to no end. It, you're right, it does not. I, I'm a little thick, more thick-headed than, than, than some of the folks in Washington would like me to be. But what I said at the time is I said this is a plan that's designed to fail. And that is the intended purpose of it. Now, I quoted leadership. I went to the Senate floor and read the leadership that said, we're going to fight against amnesty. And I said, you know what? A whole lot of us, myself included, are starting to feel like Charlie Brown with Lucy and the football. Leadership keeps promising, just wait. In two months, we'll fight then. And two months come and they give in another time. And two months come and they give in another time. And two months come and they give in another time. We are losing our country, but I'll tell you two promising things in terms of what to do about amnesty. Number one, even though one branch of, of the government is not doing its job, Congress is not doing its job of reigning in the president, another branch is the judiciary. And a federal court in Texas has enjoined President Obama's amnesty as, as contrary to federal law. And, and I'll tell you, I, I am proud that it was my home state of Texas, along with 25 other states, that led that litigation to stop the amnesty from going into effect. The second point I'll make, the second point I'll make is President Obama's principle of executive actions, live by the sword, die by the sword. I fully expect the next president on January 20th, 2017, to rescind every one of President Obama's executive actions that is unconstitutional or contrary to law. Next question. Yes, sir. You have to speak into the mic, sir.
thank you for that question. You know, I hope that the that what that scientist told you is not the case. Uh, I can tell you what the intelligence reports are that we're receiving both from American intelligence and our allies uh, are that they do not currently have a nuclear weapon, that they are trying to get one, but they don't currently have one. Now, intelligence is not infallible, and, and that has the possibility of being wrong. What I will say, one thing that gives it some added credibility is given the arrogance of the regime. If they had a nuclear weapon, I think they would test the nuclear weapon to demonstrate to the world they had it. The fact that they have not demonstrated that indicates to me that gives more re re reason to give credence to the intelligence. And it also, we have a window of time to stop them from acquiring a nuclear weapon. During this time, there are a host of tools we can use. Once they acquire nuclear weapons, it changes dramatically. The reason they want the weapon so badly is to change the terrain because they're one of two scenarios if they acquire a nuclear weapon. One, God forbid, they use it. And these are radical theocratic zealots who glorify death and suicide. And I think the odds are qualitatively higher that if they had a nuclear weapon, they would use them either against the nation of Israel or against the United States of America. Neither circumstance can we risk. The second scenario, let's suppose they acquire a nuclear weapon and don't use it. The consequence there will be an immediate nuclear escalation all throughout the, the, the Middle East. The other Arab nations, the nations in the Gulf state, you'll see the Saudis, you'll see Egypt, you'll see Turkey, all acquiring nuclear weapons to protect themselves. You'll also see Iran, which is already the leading state sponsor of terrorism in the world, using that nuclear power to be even more aggressive, projecting force outward. To take the world's most dangerous region, to proliferate nuclear weapons amongst governments across that region, many of whom have close ties to radical Islamic terrorism, increases dramatically the possibility of worldwide cataclysm. And that, by the way, is the thank God scenario. That's the scenario they don't use the nuke. If they use it, it's even worse. And that's what underscores the urgency of, in the next 21 months, shining the light on this topic, doing everything humanly possible in Congress to prevent a bad deal from going into effect, and then in January 2017, turning this policy around.